before you had a race and the moment that you got one. Was it easy? Did you just pull, yeah. pull it up? Yeah. Now, were there consistencies at your table? Like Shelly said, oh, <coughs> this moment. And then Tammy said, oh, this moment. And you're like, oh, hey, similar moments. Did, did that occur? It doesn't have to be you two. You were just an example. But. <laughs> You're a This exercise comes from a book called The Cult of Souls of Black Book by W.E.B. Du Bois. If many of you have read it, it's one of the, the it's still an incredibly uh, insightful analysis of how race matters in America. It starts with uh, Du Bois himself, is a super light skinned dude living in Massachusetts right after the Civil War, um, uh, talking about how. He always just thought he was a kid. Never thought he was any kind of, you ask him to fill out identity bubbles, he would have just filled kid and stopped there. <laughs> <laughs> but then one day in school, on Valentine's Day, before he had to give the Valentine's Day, everybody, he wanted to give a Valentine to a woman, to a girl. And she said, I don't want it, you're black. And he said, what, me, who? And it was a moment of racial consciousness, a moment of awareness, a moment when race was made for him when he became a problem or an object and no longer a human. And so I ask you when you think about this, the moments that you shared with each other, were those moments when you had race or moments when you recognized it in someone else? Have you ever been raced? If we think about it that way. Well, I think when we were younger, we were white. Absolutely, you know I mean? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. because the, the notion of race, as we've talked about it today, has to be connected to difference. When you become aware of yourself as different is not when you become aware that race exists or that you have friends who have race. It's fascinating. So I do this uh, sometimes in class at, at St. John's, and many, many of you may know that our demographic has changed significantly at that school over the past 10 years. 10 years ago, um, you, you'd have a classroom of largely uh, white kids, and you do this, and they all talk about when their aunt adopted a black kid, or a Korean kid, or when they joined a basketball team, and they were around kids who didn't look like them, that's when they knew race. And I tell them, no, not yet. That's when you're conscious of race existing, you're conscious of someone else's race, but it's not when you have been raised because you haven't been yet. Now there's a couple different things we can do with race. We can think about how we talk about it today now. Does anybody remember this guy? <laughs> You're a Democrat. <laughs> remember this guy? Um, well, so what happened right after he elected? He got elected. What, what happened right then? I mean, lots of things did, but one of them was, yay, we're post-racial. Do you remember that? <laughs> that, that whenever they, we have a black president, so race doesn't matter. Parse that sentence for me real quickly. We have a black president, so race doesn't matter. When race doesn't matter, you say, we have a president. And you stop there. So what we're trying to suggest, Brandon, as we talk about how to think about race in your classroom, and in your lives, and in your hallways, um, and with your colleagues, is that we shouldn't just dismiss race, as some people try to do, well-meaning people try to dismiss race, say it doesn't exist, say there's no such thing as race. That's not true. We shouldn't also um, uh, uh, necessarily fixate on it. But one thing that we can do, and something that we hope to do more next week, and maybe a little bit more today as we ask, as, as questions and talk about these things, is acknowledge that race matters first off. That's what today was to get us there. We have to admit that it matters. Are we good with that? Yes. Then, if it does, when does it matter? How does it matter? And where does it matter? Because it's not the same in all those things. Remember when you did your identity bubbles? The media blows it up in the situation. Then. Well, there, there's that too. But think about where you're sitting when you're watching the media, whatever it is. And think about where you take those ideas that you got from the television. And who you communicate them with, who you share them with, and who you don't. Where you share them and where you don't. Those are all just as important. Does that make sense? Especially when you think about what's happening in our classrooms. So, 
<laughs> no, no, so, <laughs> tired. You're tired? <laughs> okay. So we start off with you. I think when I work with our students over at St. Ben's and St. John's, I always remind them that we need to start with you. Because in essence, if we want to have healthier and better relationships and be more effective in the things that we do, we need to start with an awareness of self, take that to an awareness of others, then using Bloom's taxonomy, for example, synthesize that and figure out, okay, so what do we do now? How does this then impact our relationships with one another? How does this then impact how we teach? So we acknowledge that we all have complex, multicultural, and multilayered selves. Absolutely. And I think one of the things that I, I like about this particular exercise is I want and I challenge you to think about times when one of your identities was honored and dishonored. I can say that I'm a man. We get that pretty clearly. Um, however, to think about when I had to think about times when I felt embarrassed to be a man, I went to a conference in Ottumwa, Iowa, a few years ago when I lived in Iowa. And I went to a session on um, gendered violence femicide, how, in essence, it's really about how we glamorize the killing of females. I was the only male in a room of about 120 females. <laughs> Holy smokes. I noticed that. Perhaps some of the males in here notice that they're males in here. Um, that matters. That was just one of my identities that came to mind really quickly at that point in time. We notice how we repress some of our part, or some parts of ourselves to behave in public. So we all understand we're not generally wearing pajamas to work. Unless, of course, you're a college student. <laughs> that happens. <laughs> but we repress some of the thoughts that we have. You've shared, perhaps, rather freely and publicly that you identify as liberal slash democrat gentleman. I wonder if folks in this room who identify as Republican or conservative would feel less comfortable doing so. Because perhaps their perception is, this isn't a safe place for me to do that. Let's put that on our students. How many of them feel comfortable expressing to you whatever way they do at the varying ages? I'm hungry. My parents beat me. But it's OK because, well, that's just how we discipline in our culture. I didn't get much sleep last night because I was taking care of my baby brother, baby sister. Um, this girl that I like, she told me that she doesn't like people like me. Your students are coming to school every day with these stories. Obviously, they're not all negative. They're all, I mean, some of them have great happy endings of yay, kumbaya, friendship, we're playing together, resource. But we know that all of us come here, and there are parts that we leave behind. For eight hours a day, I know I am still married, but for the most part, I am focused on my job. After I leave, I'm more focused on my family. And we realize that, particularly as we delve into the dynamics since it was brought up by you all about Kennedy and Somali students and race, it's important. And it's important for our students because although we're not talking about it, they're being taught about it. They're being taught about it by how they're sitting in the cafeteria, for example, together. And I'm talking about the white students. Not necessarily the Somalis, but the Latinos, right? We do this. We do this as adults. This is why I think as we move forward, because race, for example, is one of the more salient identities that we walk into a, a space with. And we're not able to easily take that off. Even though we did the exercise with PBS, your students are coming in as raced individuals. Some of them, though, recognize that they are raced individuals, and some of them haven't gotten to that awareness yet. Anything to add before we get to our last one? So we'll be back in a week to continue the conversation about race. In that time, We'd like for you to think about this question. How and when 
of this race matter in your school. We're going to leave you with that question, and now we've got a few minutes left, or maybe a minute left. Do you have any questions or comments for us, or that you would like to share with each other? Mm -hmm.